My guest today is writer, director, and filmmaker extraordinaire, Tamika Lamison. Now, Tamika <laughs> graduated from American University and Howard University and is a AFI alum of this prestigious directing workshop for women. She was a research consultant at the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences, and prior to being tapped as the executive director of the Commercial Directors Diversity Program, a DEI program she built for the DGA and the AICP. Now, she has won numerous honors, awards, and fellowships, including IFP's Gordon Parks Indie Film Award, ABC Disney Screenwriting Fellowship, and the CBS Directors Initiative, and others. But Tamika has produced four award-winning shorts and over a hundred short docs via MAFF. Now, she was also a writer and supervising producer for the television show Monogamy. Now, her newest short film, The Powerful, and I mean emphasis on powerful, Superman Doesn't Steal is an emotional coming-of-age story set during the 1970s Atlanta child murders. Now, the film follows two siblings who, while captivated by superheroes, must confront a series of traumatic events that challenge their understanding of heroes, villains, and themselves. The film has already earned several prestigious awards. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the extraordinary filmmaker, Tamika Lamison, and her Oscar-qualified short film, Superman Doesn't Steal, to the show. Welcome, Tamika. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Wow. This film is absolutely incredible. And the media should be talking about this film more and more. So what inspired you to write and direct such a very powerful film? Well, the film is actually inspired by a core memory shared between my brother and I. So it's a true story. And um, it's about uh, an incident that happened when we were growing up. And he made sort of a critical mistake. I'll call it a critical mistake that put both of us in jeopardy and really kind of traumatized our family. And I had been wanting to tell this story for a really long time. And then finally the muse hit. And I sent it to my brother after I wrote it. He's a very harsh critic. So I knew if he gave me the thumbs up, I'd be okay. <laughs> so he um, called me. He was in tears. He said, wow, you really captured that. And you really honored that time. And now you have to do it. And I was like, oh, and now I have to do it? Oh, no. <laughs> so that's kind of how uh, everything started. And we did it uh, fairly fast, fairly quickly. And uh, we shot it during the two strikes. And uh, that ended up being kind of a win-win because um, I would just say, because everyone wanted to work and there was no work happening and they wanted to work on a great project, we were able to get some incredible cast and crew out of Atlanta um, for, you know, you know, what we might typically not have been able to uh, get them for. And also um, they were available because of the strikes. So. We were lucky in that way. Well, there is so much to unpack here in this film. So I've watched this film numerous times. So I went and, and, and wrote down a list of all of the things that I could choose out of this film. So first of all, you bring the tense element of the Atlanta child murders in 1979. Also, yes. being a black family in the 1970s sibling relationship, parenting and discipline, shoplifting, the police. So with so many elements to pay attention to in this film, it moves seamlessly and creates one of the best short films I've literally seen this year. And honestly, I mean that. Now, for you, were you taking pen and paper and and making a list on the elements you wanted in this film? 
No, it's so crazy because because it was a, um, a inspired by a true story, right? It's a true story. My brother and I, um, I just knew that I wanted to tell the story. So what actually happened was the muse hit me in a way that it has never happened before. I was on my stationary bike watching a movie and then all of a sudden it started to be like dictation in my ear. So I picked up my phone and I started to write it in my notes section of my phone while watching a movie and on my bike. And then I was just like, really? Wow. I was like, I, I say it's my ancestors. My ancestors were whispering the story. And um, actually 95% of what I put into that phone I just uh, is what you see on screen. I dumped it in final draft. I tweaked it a little bit. And that's really what you see on the screen. So um, it was always marinating in my soul, in my spirit. I had attempted to write it a couple of times before. It wasn't really coming out in a way that I thought honored the story. And so um, after this came out, I was like, this is it. I believe this is it. Now, if my brother says yes, we're, we're, we're cooking with gas. And he gave it the green light. And um, he didn't have any notes, which is, that never happens with him. <laughs> so I was, I was really excited. Um, and on we, on, on we went. Yeah, this, there are short films that are absolutely complete from beginning to end. And this is one of them. And there are elements in this film, because I, I did some little side research here. And so there are elements in this film that must have been taken from the Atlanta child murders because as I was looking, because, you know, it's not about the Atlanta child murders. It's just set in that time. And of course you have, uh, you know, you have like the, the radio in the kitchen. It, you know, it kind of mentions that into the story, but there were elements from that that I started noticing within the film. You have the forest. Mm -hmm. You have the convenience store and those two, which I've read are mentioned in the police reports of those killed. How much research mm -hmm. did you do about the child murders to maybe pull some elements and put into the film? So I did a lot of research. I watched a lot of documentaries because there's um, and I also watched um, Mindhunter, believe it or not, because Mindhunter, that television show, did a whole um uh, um, I guess series. So they had like several, um, se oh, season. So one of their seasons was about the Atlanta child murder. So I was able to watch that and see what they did. And it actually reflected a lot of what we saw in the documentaries as well. And there's a couple of television uh, documentaries, docu-series about it as well. So I, I, and I read a lot as well. And this is when I, when I um, understood that the timing for this is perfect because You'll see at the end of my film, there is a uh, quote from the New York Times, and it says that they have reopened 157 of those cases of missing and murdered kids back uh, during the 1970s, 1980s, even some of the ones that they thought were solved. So I was like, wow, there was way more kids who were snatched and murdered and killed than we ever thought. And um, they're reopening those cases now. So this is actually a perfect time for this uh, short film. Yeah. And, you know, one of the elements in this, one of the scenes, I should say, one of the scenes in this film that really gives you that tension of the Atlanta child murders is when the sister almost got lost in the shortcut coming back. So that yeah. element really kind of brought forth that tension of like, you know, because you don't know where this film is going to go. So you kind of, you've, you almost took us off track in a great way <laughs> because it brought that tension and it brought that little scary, creepy feeling that we all know. Because I remember when it hit the news in 79, I remember when I was a kid uh, here in Texas when we had... Uh, the mass murders and all of a sudden mm. all the parents are saying, okay, kids, you know, uh, you don't leave the house until you tell us where you're going and where you're going to be. And that was really odd back then. Cause you know, when you're in a small town, you get on your bike, you go anywhere you want to, you don't think yeah. about danger. 1979 no. was just like that. It really was. And you know, it's interesting because my brother said he always wondered because I, 
tell it, it sort of shifts perspectives a bit, but I do tell it through the eyes of the little girl ultimately. And my brother did ask, he said, I always wondered what it felt like for you, what it was like for you. And honestly, that crazy, uh, going back through the woods alone during that time was so frightening. I cannot, I, it, even right now I think about it and I go, that was so scary. Um, so when I'm in the when uh, I watch it with audience members, I can hear the people the their them taking their breaths and 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 I can hear people going, "Oh my God, no!" <laughs> so well, you can actually it's, hear. It's like that scene when Jackson stands there and he looks back and he's like, "I'm taking a shortcut," and you're like, "No, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that," because you're almost like wanting to yell yeah. at the screen and go, "No, Jackson, don't go that." Your mom said no. <laughs> So by bringing on the audience, they, they do that. They yell that they're like, "Oh no, don't do! You know you're not." And you hear them saying, it. "Obey your right. mother, Jackson. You'll live." <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I have to bring up one of the most disturbing parts of this film, and it I still can't get it out of my mind. I can't. I still can't get it out of the pit of my stomach because I wasn't expecting it. And it, it was a total shock, but I get why it's why it's in here. So I'm going to let you explain it. I got a gut punch in this film that I still, like I just said, I can't get out of my mind. But in the beginning of the film, we get this great sense of innocence of children. They're playing make-believe. You know, they're playing superheroes. But then it's all shattered in an instant when the children wave and are friendly. The children are friendly to a passing police car, but it's the attitude of that cop driving the car instantly shows his racist attitude. A stereotypical racist attitude that is still prevalent today. Why was that one element so vital to the internal telling of this story? So I felt that that was vital to the story for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, to show how, um, how quickly innocence can be lost, shattered, um, to, to show that we still are dealing with, we were dealing with it in the seventies and before, and we're stealing, still dealing with um, uh, that type of racism um, from law enforcement and, and other places, but also um, because, you know, the you, you also see that there's another side to the police enforcement, right? So you see that there's a duality. It's not, you know, all cops are not bad, right? So you see that there's a different mentality with the uh, partner. And I thought it was important to put all of that in there, but also specifically, kids have so many dangers, Black kids especially, they have additional dangers. So, you know, it, even when with the, the, the cop bringing the kid, you know, and all of that, it might be different if it was a, ch a white child versus a black child. And it's just very important to see that um, our innocence is lost um, in different ways. We were taught officer friendly, right? So officer friendly is not the name of the cop. It's just that when we were brought up, we would um, have cops come and they would tell us that they're all cops are officer friendly. So when you see a cop, you go, hey, officer friendly. And um, they're and you and they will always protect you and um, and help you. So it was very important for us to have that moment in there to show that not ne that's not always the case. It's not necessarily the case because there's hidden dangers everywhere. It's for children, but especially for black children. Yeah, you know, I've I've had so many discussions with many African American directors and actors. And a lot of people don't realize even today that there are two versions of the talk. The white version yes. is I'm gonna tell you about the birds and the bees. With a black yes. family or or a black child, the talk is not about the birds and the bees. It's about when you step outside this door, life's different. And yes. you really show that. And the look on the other officer's face. I mean, yeah, I was like, you know, and, and, and you did it. You did it great because it shows there are, 
good people in this world, even wearing the uniform. So like you said, the duality, you showed both sides, but the other guy didn't have to say a word. You knew yeah. what he was thinking. And it's almost like, I hate my partner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was like, he was not, he's like, Oh, I didn't realize that this is, Oh man. Okay. How are we going to handle this? Um, yeah. And you're, you're, I love what you said about the talk because it's interesting. There were two, there's two dangers, right? From the parents' side, right? When, when, when the kid comes back, the dangers is not just what's happening out there with the murderer, but the danger was also the cops. There's like multiple dangers going on. So when, when he's having the talk, I don't think that my brother or the, you know, the character in this short really got the impact until the father came down on him so hard. And then he realized the, the, the hugeness of what he had done and the possibilities of what could have happened. Yeah. And, and, and we're going to get to the father here in a moment, but I know that scene, I can still replay it. And, and that really leads back to that whole cop scene that you brought in so fast. I mean, Hey man, these kids, you know, they're making believe. <laughs> and then you just, you stole my innocence in that scene. So. <laughs> oh. Yes. You know, it's so funny. You said that because when someone, asked, I said, well, it's not just the children who lose their innocence in, in, in that moment. Um, we as audience members also are innocent about this film and what we're watching is sort of taken in that moment as well. So that's right on point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Jackson's parents, they provided him with everything and they tell him that, but he chose yeah. to steal a comic book. So as I was looking, I'm thinking, okay, I'm trying to look at it from the perspective of, of Jackson. Was he just yeah. being a kid or was he a kid that wanted more and thought his parents were unfair for not giving him more money to go to the convenience store? Because in his mind is, hey, I'm going to be there anyway to, you know, to get the milk. How about, you know, give me a little extra and I can bring myself something back. But yes, kind of went haywire after that. I think it's both. I actually think he was just being a kid because kids do things like this. Kids do impulsive things all the time. They don't think about what the impact is going to be. They don't, they just do impulsive things. That's being a kid and stupid things, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Kids disobey their parents all the time, sometimes on a big level, sometimes on a small level, right? And um, it's just that when you're a black kid, your mistakes could have for uh, deeper repercussions. So it's almost like black black people, but black children do not have the same grace and space to make mistakes as other kids because it could cost them in their lives, right? And so, um, yeah, I think it was both. And when I think about my brother and I think about our lives, yeah, we did have every, but as a kid, you're like, you don't think of it that way. You're just like, you do blame your parents for not giving you what you want, right? And sometimes you're not thinking about it on the long term. You're just, okay, well, it's no big deal. It's just a comic book, right? It's 56, whatever. That's kind of how I think he was probably looking at it. And then you really realize, no, it doesn't matter how much it is or what it is. You're stealing. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Yeah, and, and you it, know, because yeah. when, when I was looking at his decision. I went back and I'm like, but he already made other decisions prior to that. He took the shortcut through the woods after his parents or his mom told him not to. That was number yeah. one. He bought more than the bottle of milk, which he was told not to do. He, <laughs> he, you know, he, he, he bought it. He bought a Tootsie Roll pop. Now at first I thought, why did he just buy one? His sister's standing right there. If he would have bought two, he may have not gotten in trouble if he would have just no, gone straight he home. Did, he, did, he bought two. He did buy two. Oh, did he? Okay. Well, I only saw the one, but anyway. So, he but in his pocket really quickly. So that's probably why you didn't see it. That's probably <laughs> what it was. But but I was yeah. like, okay, so that, that, that's two. But it's not like he's, He's a kid that's looking for trouble. 
like you said, he's being a kid, but boy, did you surprise us in this film. We knew there was tension as he was stuffing the comic book in, in there, right. but <laughs> I didn't even think about the store owner and grabbed him from behind. What a shot that was. I mean, I almost looked at that as, uh, it's like, I think it was Alfred Hitchcock that invented, invented that shot where you shoot upward. And, mm -hmm. and it gives this whole different dynamic when you see a scene shot that way. And the way you yeah. shot it is like, oh, man. I mean, it was, I mean, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared as well. And, you know, I'm going to give some credit because when I talked about that shot with uh, Aaron G. Wesley, she's the cinematographer fabulous black woman cinematographer. She's a superstar. Um, so we were talking about how to shoot that and some ideas had come to our head, but then we, we, um, she actually talked to Alfeo Dixon, who was the, um, camera operator. And he showed us some, uh, scenes from some other films. And we sort of figured out that that was how we were going to shoot it. And we brought in our, um, stunt guy and we're able to, and we only had two, we could only do two takes because of that milk bottle. We only had two of them. So we had to get it right. <laughs> we, it was like two takes. This is such a complicated did, thing did, that we're doing. Did you have to use the second one? We did, we did it twice. And uh, we, we used both of them. We actually, because the first time, there was one thing that we didn't like about the first one. I think because when you pour the milk in, it starts to disintegrate almost immediately, right? And so we had to really craft it and coordinate it um, in serious detail. And the timing was really important. So it started to disintegrate and one little drop happened before the actual, in the first take. And we were like, we got to do that again. I mean, we'll use that other one if we have to, but we want to do it so that we, you know, so that it's perfect as, you know, <laughs> as perfect as we can get you it. You know, I, I still remember the day when milk bottles were glass and you had that in the tops weren't plastic. They were that paper with the foil on the inside that gripped yes. the, the top of the bottle. You know, when we were kids, we used yeah. to take the tops off and for some weird, stupid reason, we would chew on them. I don't know why, but, but anyway, <laughs> I remember that. So when I looked at that, I thought, oh, this, this, this film is so 1970s authentic. I loved it. But then you bring the other officer in. So, so Jackson's yeah. riding home in a police car, but it's the other officer. And and with both parents standing outside the front door, he flat told them, be glad I'm the one who responded. And I yeah. play that scene over again because I'm like, did he just say what I thought he said? Because that says a lot. Because if the other guy would have grabbed him, I would. this would have been a different film. Yes. Yes, 100%. And I thought it was really important to have that because there's all these conversations about knowing um, the community. If you, you know, the uh, police force, knowing the community that they're in and all of that kind of stuff. And so I thought it was important. And people ask me all, all the time. They're like, well, um, one, they ask, was the store owner really black? Why, why didn't I like vilify the store? And I was like, no, because he was black. And they, and I said, in my mind, I feel like the store owner called the cop that he knew would do what he needed, which is scare the kid, but take care of him. Right. That's kind of how I saw it. Right. So, so I don't even vilify the store owner. Cause some people are like, but why would he do that? And I'm like, because he probably wanted to teach him a lesson as well, but he also wanted to make sure he was going to be okay. Well, yeah, so and at the same time, what? And and we have to remember that on the at the at the counter, he's got that little sign, you yes. know, because <laughs> you know, it, you know, because he knows as a store owner, okay, if two kids walk in, you got to keep an eye out. If three kids or four kids walk in. Okay, you you need to rush him to the counter and then out that door because he's probably been shoplifted before. So that's how I figured out on that end and why he grabbed Jackson the way he did. But you bring up mm -hmm. the great point because 
you know, even in small areas, you're going to, a lot of us always would know the names of the officers. So if one responded, you'd go, hey, officer, whatever, and you know what their demeanor was. He just wanted the kids scared, not throw them in the slammer. Yes, that's how, that's definitely how I look at it. And I, and I did think it was important for people to see that this cop was letting them know, you, you know, a lot of things. <laughs> He's like, I took care of him. Um, but, you know, you got to make sure that this doesn't happen again, because it might not be me next time. Right. You know, kids will be kids, but you know what we're dealing with here on all the levels, you know, the society, the cops might not be me. Um, your kids got to, you know, pull it together. <laughs> That's it. Well, you know, you know one of the things that surprised me as we learn in this film that this wasn't the first time Jackson had done this. Yeah. It was his first time getting caught. Why was yes. it important to show that he had done it before, but you did it with, I mean, it's almost like a sleight of hand kind of thing. You, you did it, but you didn't focus on it. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it's that scene in the living room. And we're going to get we're going to get to the actors here in a moment, but that was a great scene. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I remember asking my brother this question when all of this happened. And it really impacted me that it wasn't the first time. Right? Like I, I, it was almost like getting to know something about my brother that was completely not anything I would have thought about him. Because of course I hero worshiped him, worshiped him. like Harriet hero worships her brother. So she does see him as a bit of a superhero. So I, I feel like it was important because he, it, it's when you get caught that things really kind of land on you. And you might keep doing certain things, until something different happens that really lets you know the uh, profound nature of what you've done. Yeah, yeah. And so and I felt like why well, it was important. It, it was very important. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about the parents' reaction <clears throat> because you were bold in, in, the, <clears throat> in, the, in the areas of this film. And, and I commend you for not holding back. So mm. his parents' reaction to his shoplifting was on point and it was natural. Mm -hmm. You bring in, which I, I hope a lot of parents will take this in and learn from, <laughs> the spanking scene, which is more of the audience hearing it than seeing it. Now, I remember the days of getting the belt. I, I wasn't immune to that. So I loved that part of the film, regardless if people agree with it or if they don't. That That's on them. But mm -hmm. I'm glad you didn't hold back. I'm glad you were authentic and showing that because there are parents that have no problem doing correction in that manner. For you, mm -hmm. though, what reactions did you receive from that scene since it seemed that spanking, as we know of it today, a lot of people just don't use it for corrective correction anymore? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, well, I'll first say my brother wanted it to be more intense. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sure that's viscerally your memory, but... <laughs> There, there, there's yeah. spanking and then there's abuse. Okay. This was right, a spanking. Exactly. <laughs> this was a spanking, not an abuse, not abuse. Um, so people, there are definitely people who cry when they see that scene. I hear them in the audience crying and it, and, and I sometimes still cry when I, um, watch that scene and I, and I cry when I hear his response after the spanking, when, um, He's asked, you know, uh, when she says, you know, the title, which he, he confesses to stealing more. Um, and he says, I'm not, 
I'm not Superman. When he says that, it makes me cry, you know. Um, most people do talk about, they know it's the 70s, so they forgive it. <laughs> so they go, well, I knew it's like back then, that's what happened. We all know that's what happened in the 70s. Some people still, um, you know, will corporate use cor corporal punishment. Most people don't, but there are some people who actually said, no, he should have gotten, he should have got what he got. He needed that in order to um, curb the behavior. So there are some people who thought absolutely he needed to get that, that needed to happen to him. They would have done it again today. Um, and, and But most people understand that back then, that's what we did. Um, but maybe we would do things a little bit different today. And um, my brother still holds a little bit of a grudge. I mean, our family has been healed by this. I will say that. That whole, uh, has it has been healed because we've talked about it now. And my brother has been able to express how it really impacted him. He says that the what he had to do with the comic books in the fireplace hurt him more than the spanking. I, I believe that. And, and it showed in the film. You yeah. know, I mean, I... I mean, I know when I was a kid, I wasn't immune to the belt. And even mm -mm. even when, I think even up till when I graduated high school, Monday morning, Monday morning announcements in school, the first thing they did was made the list of all the names that are coming to the office to get theirs. Wow. And that's and, in school, not even your parents. Yeah. And the, at, at the school, and of course, it was scarier I think in in my in my high school because the one that was giving the licks was the golf coach. Oh my gosh. Oof. So we knew he had a swing. So mm -hmm. and, and 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 to tell you to tell you just to kind of make a little make it kind of funny, he would he would give you two choices. Do you want two half swings or do you want one full swing? Oh my goodness! And I'm like, what difference does it make? <laughs> it's going to hurt. <laughs> so, but but no, I'm glad that you put that scene in there. And you're right, Jackson was hurt more by burning the comic books because his sister asked him, "Did you steal yeah. all of those?" And he goes, yeah. "No, not all of them." And I thought, then why aren't you just burning the ones you stole? Right. So I'm trying to figure that little scene out. So why did you have it to where he had the mixture? Because my, because I, I believe that my dad told him, you guys got to burn them all. You got to burn, burn them all. He probably just, and also I think from my brother, I don't think that he remembered what he stole and what he didn't. So he just grabbed a stack. So I feel like that's probably closer to what happened. He yeah, that makes sense. Grabbed and he was in his emotions, right? So burn all of them, burn the ones you, and, and so he just grabbed a stack and that's what happened. But I, yeah, that was painful because in the movie, so here's a little movie funny. So it, obviously there was just a few people in the house uh, family when it was happening, but in real life, it was a house full of our family members when all of this happened. So it was a house full of, we had a family gathering, they hurt, everyone could hear him getting whipped. And he had to walk through like five or six people who were in the living room in order to get to the fireplace. So it was really rough. Oh, it was and rough. you know what? <clears throat> when when you when you start showing the shots going through the house, there there's quite a there's quite a few people there. And yeah. So when all this erupts after the the officer brings him back home, you, mm -hmm. I mean, you feel the tension, but you also feel part of the embarrassment of the other people in the house because nobody likes to be in the midst of a family issue when you're not part of it because you're like, you know, I could just go in my car and leave. These people yeah. live here but you have to ride that journey as a bystander and that's uncomfortable. Oh, it's so uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. And you know, family with all the family dynamics and stuff and all the judgments and the jealousies and the, all the things that come with being in a family. Uh, yeah, that was, that was harsh. And uh, 
even some of the family that were there when it happened, when we did a screening, some of them didn't know what they were going to come see. But once it unfolded on screen, they realized, they remember, they were like, oh my God, I, I was there with that. And they started to really remember when it was happening. So that was really interesting too. Wow. I mean, I love this <laughs> film. I love the film, but I've got to ask you because the moment I started watching it, I just saw it. You captured the 1970 time period to perfection. I mean, where did you find the location and the interior of the home was literally a step back in time? I mean, seriously, did you find a time capsule? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit of a time capsule. I actually came to um, Atlanta about a month early to do location scouting. And um, this was, but we found this house. Um, it was on one of those sites where you, uh, they, you know, allow filming. And it was and immediately when I saw that house, I knew it was the, the one that we wanted to use. And so um, I think I only looked in, at the interior of one other house when I landed. I was like, that's our house. Um, some of it was already sort of a period. So our uh, team, our production design team, they came in and they really added all of the um, accents. Like they didn't have to bring huge furniture in, which was a blessing, but they added a lot of the other things. And um, our uh, production designer, Jessica Pinkstone, amazing she does a lot of commercial stuff and she knew how to do use um cheaper resources in order to get the biggest bang for the buck and um and then our uh hair and design team they were all just perfection they were wonderful everyone brought their a game but they also brought their love of the project to to the um to the 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 creation of it so uh the hair person mandra harge and um, makeup, Patrice Coleman, they were they were all fantastic. I had such a great crew and uh, cast. The two young uh, actors were also from Atlanta as well. And um, yeah, they were wonderful. I just tried to stay out of their way as a director. <laughs> well, okay, because I, I was going to ask you because I know that Jackson is Ellis Hobbs the fourth, and then yes. she is Jordan McIntosh. So they're playing the brother and sister. What's it like directing children? So I, I have to say they made it really easy. Jordan is, um, you know, they're professional. She's on a show with Kerry Washington called Unprisoned. And he's in a, um, he play, she plays like the little mini Kerry Washington. I saw her and I knew she was the one because she reminded me of me. And she was playing me as a little girl. And then uh, a friend, uh, my friend Chad Coleman was in a movie with Ellis. And he said, there's this young kid. You should check him out. So I literally just, uh, I saw a little clip of him and he sent me a, a tape within three seconds. I knew he was the right kid. He's fantastic. And um, they already were bringing such incredible emotion to these characters. What I actually did was I would let them do it the way they wanted to do it. We talked about it and all that kind of stuff. And then I would give them subtle direction just to see if they could do it a different way. And I was just so happy when my subtle direction was something that their eyes lit up and they tried it and it worked. But sometimes when they would do, they do what they did. And I'd be like, that was good. Let me see if I can give them some more direction. And I was like, nope, just go back to what you were doing. Cause you we were great. That's what I mean by staying out of their way. Because sometimes I gave them micro adjustments that were great and they would work, but often they were already there. They knew what they were doing. They, um, they understood the story because we talked about it and um and they were they were really great. For my my experience working with kids was was wonderful cuz these kids were stars. <laughs> well, who played the father because he was incredible. I mean, you got his look down so perfect. I'm like, okay, is Shaft coming out with a new sequel or or what? <laughs> That is so Mustafa Shakir. So he's been around for a while. He's on uh he's on Cowboy Bebop, Deuces. Um he's done oh, he was the bad guy on Luke Cage for a season. So he's been, you know, he's been around doing his thing. And I he was a personal friend of mine who 
actually donated a song to the film. That was my first, and he said, yeah, you can use this song for the end credits. Then I asked him to be in it and he was like, I live in the Netherlands. Maybe you should get someone a little bit closer. I was like, okay. But then when we switched from shooting in LA, cause of course we couldn't find that look in uh, the look we wanted for Atlanta in LA. Um, uh, we lost our uh, lead. And so I asked him if he would do it. And he said, yes, which I was so grateful for. So he flew himself, you know, flew out from the Netherlands and he stepped into the role of the father and he was fantastic. And I have to say that last song is his song. He created the our, our uh, in credit song, which is perfect for the film, Superman, uh, uh, a black superhero. And he had created this song, not for the film. It's just after he said, yes, I looked at his Instagram and I saw he posted a new song. And I was like, Mustafa, <laughs> did you write this for the film? And he said, no, I'm only realizing the connection. And I said, well, you know, you have to give us that song for the end. He's like, yes, you can have it. So, and it's the perfect, remarkably the perfect song for the film, but he was great. And what he brought, um, he was able to bring the power but also the love and the vulnerability. And he did ask me, he was like, well, um, as a father, I'm just curious why you want me to, you know, why you want to show me the vulnerability of me crying after the beating and everything. And I said, I think it's really important because everyone can relate to their parents. It doesn't even matter race. None of that matters saying this hurts me more than it hurts you. But to see that it does, and to see a parent responding to what they had to do, especially a black man and his vulnerability, I thought was very important to show. But what, yeah, because what I loved was in that scene, he's showing his disappointment yes. in his son privately, not with his son around. He's disappointed. And in a way, he, he still hurts from having to correct him, but he also knows if he would, if he would have not done it, he wouldn't, they wouldn't be in the, he wouldn't be there to do it. But the other thing that I love that why he was so perfectly cast. Yeah. He is strong. He is the head of the household. Mm -hmm. uh, he cares for his wife and children. He, he wants everyone to be, you know, respect, respect, respectful, be a, a pillar of the community. So he shows that strength. And in a way, it's almost like when I, when I watched his character, I'm like, why can't other guys learn from that? Cause it's like here in a short film and this is rare in a short film. So you have this element, you actually have a character. That's a great role model when people watch it. Yes. Yes, he is that. And I thought it was very important to have that in this film, to have all of those things. Um, he brings that power, the head of the family, like you said, but he also has the off screen with his wife vulnerability where he feels like he can share that with her, but you know, he doesn't want the kids to see that because he has to be that in a way it's like that superhero. So when we talk about the superhero and villain themes, it's like everyone, depending on their perspective, sees someone as a superhero or a villain, and it definitely shifts. Because I think Jackson sees his father as a superhero, but then he sees him as a villain <laughs> at one point when he's getting his corporal punishment. But I think ultimately he understands, you know, he ultimately understands what's what's going on on a different level. And I feel like the same is with um, Harriet and her brother. He's a superhero to her, then maybe a little bit of a villain, but it, but then she realizes it doesn't matter. You're still my brother and I love you no matter what. And I think that's the important thing for people. It's like, you don't have to be a superhero, right? We make mistakes and we should be loved anyway. You know, we should well, be Well, you had that regardless. dynamic with the police officers. One was a villain that's and you had another yeah. one that I guess, you know, he could be wearing a cape. And uh, so right. you had, I mean, and, and see, this is, this is the beauty when I see these great films where down to the little details and the nuances, even down to the characters that they're, that they're mirroring the theme 
of the film. So you have this mm -hmm. superhero and villain theme going throughout this film and people, if they take time to see it, they're going to see the differences and they're going to see that this whole film is from beginning to end is one whole piece. And, mm -hmm. and that's what makes this mm -hmm. film so amazing for you though. You wrote, directed, starred in, <laughs> casted, casted this film. Are you Superwoman? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm definitely not a Superwoman, but I sometimes feel like it. <laughs> I feel like I have to be right doing all of those things. It was look, it's I. It was it's hard to wear all those hats, and you have to have an incredible team who supports you and. I will add who loves you <laughs> because they have to do a lot of extra work, right? To support, um, to support you so that you can actually do all of the jobs that you need to do and do them well, because I was still actively writing. I was getting like two hours of sleep. I was actively writing when I went back. So, uh, cause I added stuff to that scene in the living room because I felt there were some things I was like, there's a couple of beats that, need to be in here that aren't in here yet. And I will also say that my producers were like, when Mustafa walked on the set, they were like, can you write some more for him? <laughs> <He's so good. laughs> and I was like, yeah, actually I can. Actually, there's some more that needs to happen in that scene. So I actually will. Um, so I was actively doing all of those things. And we were in a group house in Atlanta, the crew was a crew house. So after I would come home and hear all the producer stuff because I was still actively producing. So I would hear what went wrong and what needed to happen. And I was like, okay guys, I'm going down into the basement so that I can prep for tomorrow. Handle the things. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like, I, I can see where they would want the father to have a larger part because, but I have to say though, he has a tremendous presence in his scenes, yes. but he doesn't overpower the film. Yes. Because we always yes. focused on the brother and the sister in the whole film because both of those kids, they carry this thing. They did. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, you know, that was the focus and it worked. So every character had their place, but nobody overpowered it because it was still based on the two kids. This film is just stupendous. Now you're Oscar qualified and, <laughs> and I know that you alluded to some of the audience's reactions, but when it shows, when it shows at a film festival, what are some of the questions that you receive? So when it's shown at a film festival, people want to know, um, well, they, they definitely want to know if, if we really shot it in, you know, where do we shoot it? Like, where did it actually happen? They want to know that. They want to know what inspired it. They want to know how my family received it. And if my brother felt that um, uh, I captured uh, the moment, how he felt about it. They want to know that. Um, they want to know uh, if there's a feature, like if there's an expanded version of it. That's one of the major questions, is there expanded version? They want to know where I found those kids. They want, because they're so good. They're like, how did you find those kids? They're so good. And, um, and they want to know um, if, uh, how hard it was to wear all those hats. That those are the main questions that I get. And um, they always talk about their feelings, right? They talk about their feelings as far as how scared they were for the little girl in the woods. They talk about the corporal punishment. They talk about how much they loved the moment where the father was being vulnerable and showing the aftermath of the corporal punishment and, um, and, and the kids at the fireplace. They like how the title is in the film. They like how the the title is revealed in that moment at the fireplace. Yeah, I love that. Now, you have to tell me, <clears throat> did you ever get any grandmothers coming up to you and lean in and say, uh, you know, if these kids today got a spanking, we wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> I definitely got a couple of people saying, I think that we need to bring back the corporal punishment. <laughs> and I was like... I don't know. I mean, we can't send them to their rooms because their rooms are like a flipping 
fancy hotel. They want to go to their rooms, right? So we can't do that, but we have to figure out something else. Like I think taking away the um, the uh, uh, cut, technology works. Cut the Wi-Fi off. Cut the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yes, I definitely think that one works. Yeah. Yeah. And, I don't. And I, I'm, no. Oh, go, go ahead. No. Go, no, go, you go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm excited to expand it. I am doing a feature, so I'm excited to expand this um, this project into a feature and delve into this, the, this, this family a little bit more and into the Atlanta child murders. Okay, that's what I was going to ask because I kept thinking, you could leave it as is, be happy with it. If you went with the feature route, which I can see, yeah, you do have to bring in the Atlanta child murders because there's so much to explore there. And because of the two kids, they show the absolute opposite because we see what innocence looks like. Then when you see what the true side of the villain looks like, because I, you know, I was really shocked back in the day when they arrested the guy because I didn't realize how young he actually was. I mean, the photos, he actually looked older than his age. But, yeah, you know, everybody said, well, you know, the moment we arrested him, the murder stopped. And, I'm, and, and, I, and for, for the life of me, there for a while, I could never put those two things together because I'm like, how do you know? Right. And they now didn't. you bring... <laughs> yeah, see, you bring up that point earlier about now they want to go back and open the books on 150, 157 murders. Yeah, because they didn't, the murders didn't actually stop. There was more going on and there was more people. I mean, Wayne Williams did murder some of those kids, but he did not murder all of those kids. And so in the expanded version, um, we have more of a motley crew of kids. So it's a motley crew of neighborhood kids who um, are into the comic books and they have their own little thing going on. And then one of them disappears and they have to solve uh, that disappearance. And, um, you know, there's a some of them think it was the Atlanta child murderer, but uh, Harriet thinks that it's someone else. And so she has to set out to prove that it maybe wasn't the Atlanta child murder. Maybe it was someone else in the community. I want to see the feature. <laughs> I, I really see want to. <laughs> well, here I've got to ask you because there's there's something. What made this film complete? The cinematography and the coloring mm. was perfect. Mm. It was 1970s the whole way. Yeah. Yeah, I and and again, I had such a great team. We have this incredible post. So um, I had a relationship with Cosmo Street. They donated our post. They did the entire post for free because they love the film. And they brought in all of their um, other resources and partners uh, like Apache and all these in the end who did the titles for us and all the, and, and people who did the, you know, Lime did the music. So they all came in and really gave their heart and soul to this film and we are forever grateful because the color, all of that stuff, you know, my cinematographer, but of course Apache and, and all of them. And they also did some of the um, visual effects because we couldn't do the fire on the set with the kids. So all of that stuff came after. (laughs) And I'm so grateful because I'm like, I need fire. Wow. That, you know, because sometimes when I'm looking at, you know, when you see a fireplace scene, you don't see the fire. You just see the flicker on right, their face. Right. Sometimes I'm thinking it's one of those lights they put in there that creates. Yes. I mean, I even have one of those lights that can create the effect of lightning or or a campfire. So that's what I was kind of thinking. But to put it in post, that's just freaking brilliant. <laughs> Some, sometimes, yeah. you know, magic happens in post. Magic happens in post. And we had to be, you know, we had to be, um, uh, we couldn't be, do anything dangerous on the set. And we were, you know, with kids and lighting matches and fire and all that. And I was like, okay, well, we're going to do what we're going to do, but we got to have fire. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> we'll figure it out in post. <laughs> oh my gosh. This, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you this. 
Superman Doesn't Steal is an emotional coming-of-age story set in the 1970s Atlanta child murders. Now, this film takes us through the eyes of eight-year-old Harriet, who is as fascinated with superheroes as her older brother Jackson. However, they, when they experience a troubling series of events that impact their family, leaving emotional scars and causing them both to grow up fast, they must redefine their definitions of heroes, villains, and themselves, and yes, even Superman. The short film, Superman Doesn't Steal, for me, is finding the hidden jewel amongst the hundreds of Oscar-qualified films this season. If you haven't seen it, you have got to see it. And I encourage all the Academy members to take a serious look at this film. The storyline brings so much for us to explore. I call it perfection. The cinematography captures the 1979 time period, again, to perfection. Not one detail was missed, and being one who was born in Atlanta, the location and the decor took me back to my own grandparents' house. I'm from Dunwoody, an area of Atlanta, so the moment I saw the homes, I was back in the 1970s again. But I will say it again and again, Superman Doesn't Steal is the hidden jewel in the midst of this Oscar-qualified chaos, and I loved <laughs> every single minute of it and when you see it you will too because you'll know exactly what i'm talking about tamika i want to thank you so much for not only creating this film and being bold enough to tell your story and taking time with us today to share this film you are welcome back anytime and i'm going to be on the front row when that feature finally happens Oh my gosh, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you for all of your kind words about the film and all of the love. Um, we are so grateful. And um, your words, your from your mouth to God's ears, right? A amen to that. And, and you know, you know, there are there are films, and I, you know, I don't ever make predictions, but I would love, I would love to see this film make the Oscar shortlist because I see so many of them and there are those films that just kind of stand out in my mind that I don't forget. This is a film that I won't forget. And for all of you out there who are friends of mine and your Academy members, you better plug in to the Oscar portal and you better pull up Superman Doesn't Steal because this film is going to steal your heart. So, Tamika, again, many, many, many thank yous for coming on and, and giving me the honor to watch this film. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. You have made my, my day, my week, my year. <laughs> and uh, I so appreciate you. And um, uh, I look forward to talking to you again. And Hopefully we'll talk to you on the other end when something really a golden happens. Let's hey, see. <laughs> I love that because it's not the red carpet. It's the golden journey that only happens when you when you are in the midst of the whole Oscar run and you're in the midst of the Oscar run. And uh, to me, again, you always have an open invitation to come back. So, I, I, you know, whatever film you come up with next, just let me know. I sure will. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> and and as for me, ladies and gentlemen, you're either going to see me at the movies or from the red carpet.